Hey everybody, it's Robert Cadnes with the Chatham County Public Information Office, and I want to thank you again for checking out this edition of the chat. I am joined by my co-host Sean Evans. Sean, how are you? Doing all right, sir. How are you? Excellent. You know, today's guest is someone that I've been really wanting to talk to for for a while. Um, I've been fortunate enough to know him for the seven years that I've been in Chatham County. He is a corporal with the Chatham County Police Department and he heads up the behavioral health unit at that department. His name is Corporal Hiram Rivera. Corporal, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing, sir? Thanks for joining us today. I know that you're busy and taking time out of your day to talk about this all important topic that I think touches a lot of people more so now than ever. Um, tell us a little bit about first yourself and how you became so passionate with the Behavioral Health Unit. Robert, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I've been uh, in law enforcement since 2001. I've been a law enforcement officer for 22 years. Um, started my career in 2001 with the Savannah Police Department and worked my way right. from patrol on the South Side Precinct. Um, had opportunities throughout my career um, to serve as a homicide, violent crimes detective, a hostage negotiator, um, a police department instructor, um, and from there, you know, been promoted to sergeant and lieutenant. Um, so throughout my years uh, with serving Chatham and Savannah, um, I've had some experiences with, you know, trauma and with mm -hmm. mental health and with some of the things that, that, have, uh, you know, that we've been faced with over the years, especially surrounding crisis intervention and, and, uh, and, and our response to that. You know, we didn't really plan this, but, it, you know, you have to be aware, you are aware of, you know, the, the mass shooting that happened in Maine. Um, there are reports that <clears throat> the gentleman was, you know, somewhat having a mental issue. Let's start with the foundation. Tell us about the Behavioral Health Unit, its philosophy, and how it's being implemented at the department. Um, so. You know, before we can like talk about like how we got to BHU, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like how did we get to that particular point? Um, so, crisis intervention has been in Chatham County for well over a decade. I mean, we've been teaching officers how to do uh, crisis intervention response um, based off of the Memphis model, uh, which the state of Georgia adopted in 2006. Um, around 2010, 2012. Um, Chatham was merged with Savannah. We were the Savannah Chatham Metro Police Department. And at that particular time, our command staff had committed the department to 100% uh, trained within, uh, with CIT, with a 40 hour CIT class. And uh, during that time, I was challenged and kind of pushed and embarked on a mission of trying to get every police officer that served in Chatham County, whether it was with SPD, Chatham County Police, Bloomingdale, any of the municipalities, uh, we were gonna get them on board and teach them a 40 hour Georgia's 40-hour crisis intervention training. Um, that course, so in 2014, uh, I was recognized as a, a trainer of the year within CIT, and I had an opportunity to go to you know, CIT International Conference and, and do some traveling and see some models that were elsewhere in the country. And it was there that I started seeing other places putting together new ideas like officers and clinicians, um, putting together civilian teams to respond to crisis calls, um, a variety of different uh, types of programs that were out there that were very proactive mm -hmm. in how they were addressing their mental health issues within that community. Uh, just playing off of that, Corporal, what do you think was the transition or the tipping point for other departments and agencies around the country to really make that a priority? Um, a, a variety of different things, I think, first and foremost, what we see in the media, right? Um, you know, you see things like police officers interacting with individuals uh, with autism or, you know, uh, some other developmental disability or some other issue that many times police officers misunderstand mm -hmm. the, the, the physical cues or the verbal cues uh, and they mistake that for um, non-compliance or, you know, some sort of, um, you know, disorderly conduct in which, you know, we end up using force unnecessarily or some other things. And, you know, it, it brings us back to that question of what type of training are we giving our officers to recognize signs and symptoms of mental illness and um, do officers really understand that mental illness isn't a crime and that we don't want to criminalize folks mm -hmm. who are having underlying you know, issues with, 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 you know, with their mental health? Absolutely. Well, uh, there are other subsidiaries of the BHU here in Chatham County, like the Enhanced Crisis Intervention Team. What are those and, and how do they work? 
So, um, so how, let me break this down a little slow because we do have a couple of different components within mm -hmm. the behavioral health unit. Um, so the behavioral health unit overall uh, is designed to follow up and provide um, uh, connectivity to resources for individuals who are um, suicidal, um, uh, addicted to drugs and alcohol, those types of things, and, uh, and, and who have the types of disorders that are affecting their day-to-day -day activity. Um, so the idea is the BHU is going to conduct some follow-up to try to connect those families and those individuals with care. So how do we get the information or how do we find out who needs that particular follow-up? It starts with the Enhanced Crisis Intervention Team Officers. Um, so what we are doing is we're taking our frontline officers, officers that are on the street that respond to calls every day. Mm -hmm. traffic work, they do you know, criminal investigations, all the other sorts of things, and we want to take a handful of those guys and we want to train them in enhanced crisis intervention training. So basically ECIT training builds on the 40-hour CIT class that mm -hmm. we're already giving officers. What this training does is it gives officers um, some experience understanding some of the new resources that we're creating mm -hmm. um, for their um, use and for the community. Uh, it gives them some suicide intervention training. Uh, we give them some one-on-one some -on -one suicide intervention training where they are certified on how to recognize, um, engage, ask the tough questions, and making sure that we're doing what we can to get individuals connected to, um, to care, especially who have suicidal thoughts and ideation. Uh, we teach officers how to recognize the dangers of fentanyl. Um, because mm -hmm. overdoses are important mm -hmm. um, to understand the data that's behind all of that and, and yeah. what communities those are impacting. Um, we also, and I think, and, and most importantly, we teach officers, you know, self-care, you, know, you know, coping skills to how to manage the, you know, the self, you know, what you're going through, what you're experiencing, um, the type of uh, vicarious trauma that comes through an eight or 12 hour shift of being a police officer. Mm -hmm. And then we're responding to a call in which we've got to recognize what's happening and address what's happening right in front of us, knowing that we've experienced what we have throughout the day. Yeah. Um, so we try to give them a little bit of all of that training uh, and then give them some uh, tactics and, and communication training so that they're not putting themselves at unnecessary risk or the public at unnecessary risk when they're trying to de-escalate or engage with the community. How are, just following up off of that, how are officers selected for that ECIT? Do they express interest and then they're brought on for that extra training or are they selected by the department? Uh, a little bit of, a little bit of all of those okay. things. A little bit of all those things. So on the onset of this program, it's very important for me to make sure that we are as successful as possible mm -hmm. um, because I want this program to be uh, a benefit to not only the police departments but to the community. It's important that the people who are involved are completely engaged, not just know the knowledge, but have the, the, the skill set mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and uh, the demeanor and the qualities uh, that makes them a unique individual for these types of crisis mm -hmm. calls. So yes, right. it does start with interest. I mean, okay. we do want people who want to do this kind of work because yeah. you know there is a certain level of, of compassion fatigue that kind of comes with going to these kinds of calls over and over and over again mm -hmm. and seeing the same individuals over and over again. Right. Um, but the other piece is we also want to make sure we're uh, looking at their use of force historically mm -hmm. to make sure they're not uh, identified as an individual who has um, some problems with it use of force um, within their departments. Make sure that we talk to their supervisors and make sure the supervisors understand um, that, uh, or can at least tell us a little bit about their demeanor just on the watch, right? You know, mm -hmm. are they hot-headed? Are they, you know, even keel? You know, are these individuals who are very uh, you know, creative in their in their thought process and how they're resolving things? I mean, mm -hmm. and those are some of the types of things that we want to, uh, skills and, and qualities we want to ascertain about who's coming onto the unit because okay. sometimes it's those intangible skills that many times will make will make that officer stand out from your average officer on the street who is who is writing calls and doing the day-to-day -day yeah. work interesting well how long are officers trained for the unit and you did touch on that a little bit uh, what specifically are they learning in that training so the uh, ECIT class is a 24-hour course uh, and like I said in the, uh, the onset we want to talk specifically about the, the new resources that we're bringing on mm -hmm. uh, the behavioral health crisis center and a few of the other service provider partners mm -hmm. who have um, you know who have come to the table and helped us uh, develop and, and revise policy and procedure and make sure that we're, we're operating as efficiently as possible within uh, within the scope of our, our duties mm -hmm. um, so we give them again a full day of, of, of resource uh, resource training they they meet the people who are working 
at the facility so there is a name with a face yeah. not just a location and an address that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, you know we take them through the officer self-care components uh, we want to make sure that they have all that OD training officer self-care training mm -hmm. um, all of those uh, pieces are important because when we send them back out to the streets they are going to be the go-to officers on their shifts and on their watches for crisis intervention referral and for those particular services. Right. Um, so the idea would be the information would funnel to those officers and those officers would know exactly how to reach the referral units and those other components there. Um, in addition to that piece, so we've talked a little bit about the ECIT, right? Yeah, right. Um, so you've got officers on the streets that are responding to calls. They go to a crisis call, suicide, uh, suicidal ideation, someone who's um, overdosed, someone who's got alcohol um, and, and, and drug addiction problems, someone who's suffering from some other uh, mental health issue, whether it's schizophrenia, um, you know, some excited delirium issue. Uh, either way, officers will respond. They'll use their knowledge, skills, and abilities to get that situation under control. And once that is done, this is where the piece comes in with referring somebody for services, right? Once we get the situation under control, the officer there is going to make some initial investigation and try to find out, you know, what the underlying issues are and then try to make a referral hmm. to the BHU for us to come back and provide some resources to help address those particular issues that might be um, present that are causing the particular crisis. Again, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be homelessness, it could be um, other circumstances that are creating the crisis situation for that individual. Mm -hmm. And what the referral team is going to do is come to that individual after the crisis is done mm -hmm. and try to problem solve with them and try to get them the best resources to help that individual get themselves back to a stable life. And that follow up's huge. Yes, it makes all completely, the completely huge, completely huge. Yeah. Because we don't want to be reactive. The idea is you mm -hmm. don't want to wait for somebody to fall into a crisis to commit crimes, um, to, to, to require a 911 police response mm -hmm. if we can gather the data and get ahead of the problem and try to address those individuals that we can sometimes almost see a pattern of them going into a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. We can try to intervene and break that particular cycle of addiction and criminality. Which is what Chatham County has been trying to do for quite a few years now. Well, and you've seen this this program, this unit develop. What impact is it having on the community and within the department? Um, so, I mean, as a as a community project, it's been um, for me, it's just been very motivating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a police officer um, for ten years, working through and teaching CIT um, to officers in the area, and then to turn around and see in 2017, 2018, Chatham County. Um, work on this breaking the cycle project in which they utilize the sequential intercept model um, to give us our roadmap on how we can find ways to intervene and break this cycle of, 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 of criminality, of, of, of sending people to jail and the jail being our housing storehouse right. for trying to get folks the treatment that they need. Um, so it really um, was uh, inspiring. Mm -hmm. to, to know that when I was coming to the table to see what we can do on the front end before we put people in jail, mm -hmm. there was also people sitting at the table, judges, um, yes. clerks, yes. Um, you know, other very important people within our community that were sitting at the table um, at those other intercepts. Mm -hmm. When somebody goes into jail, how are we doing, what are we doing to, to get them the treatment that they need? Right. When they hit the courts, what are we doing to try to get these people the treatment they need? Mm -hmm. So the idea is everyone at the table is realizing that we need to do a better job at finding ways to address the underlying issues that are causing people to commit crimes mm -hmm. and, and again affect their ability to, mm -hmm. to live healthy lives and, and, and again to not be a, uh, a utilizer of the 911 judicial system right. um, to try to get them uh, where they need to be. I've had some conversations with uh, Judge Friesman and Colbert about that yes, exact sir. topic and I know they're very involved as well. Uh, what are some of the strategic partners in the community utilized by the trained officers and I know you did touch on that as well as far as the the crisis center itself and, and some of the ECIT training and meeting those people out there in the community but um, what are some of those that are utilized by the officers uh, for someone in distress and how are they identified for individual service? So, um, you know, typically in the past, you know, we would either go to Memorial ER mm -hmm. or we'd mm -hmm. take them to jail. Like, you know, it was either there was a reason to arrest them, there was something present where we were going to be able to make an arrest, mm -hmm. or we were trying to get them up and get into Memorial ER. Um, 
times have changed mm -hmm. and now there's a lot of resources uh, that are out there some of them public some of them private resources sure. so um, sometimes navigating the mental health resource um, community is uh, it can be a daunting task to know where to go first or who to go who to call next mm -hmm. um, so what we've done is we have uh, partnered with the Behavioral Health Crisis Center, Gateway. And mm -hmm. Gateway is our primary partner um, for our crisis stabilization within uh, Chatham County. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're trying to do is funnel all of our uh, major mental health um, situations to Gateway, um, especially if we're not quite sure what resources needed. Uh, many times if we can get them into Gateway, Gateway can do the initial assessment mm -hmm. and triage was happening and then make the referral to whatever specialized service that we might be needed in the aftermath, which is what makes Gateway a very vital partner for us sure. um, because we at least have a central place where we can take an individual who may be in crisis and then they can help us figure out what the next steps are for that particular individual once they're stabilized. Um, so Gateway is a big, uh, is a big partner for us. Uh, we uh, also utilize the front porch. Uh, for children and families. So mm -hmm. a big component of this program is not about helping the individual who's suffering from mental illness. Um, we know and we recognize that a person who suffers from mental illness or who's dealing with a mental illness um, also has family members that are impacted by that, neighbors, sure. um, co-workers, um, people who care about them. Um, and those individuals many times need help and services. Many times they need education or they need resources to help them um, address or deal with um, the day-to-day -day ups and downs of living with and caring for someone who is who's dealing with a mental illness. Um, so the front porch is a great resource that we utilize to address uh, the needs within our children. Yes. Um, so you know, one component that we have within our BHU that hardly gets mentioned but is, uh, is critical is the component called Handle with Care. Um, so we utilize a Handle with Care component mm -hmm. that uh, partners the uh, Chatham, Savannah Chatham Board of Education with us. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when our officers, any officer, whether it's a CIT officer or a patrol officer, responds to a call and there are children present mm -hmm. who are observing a trauma, who are a part of what's happening, mm -hmm. who are in the peripheral, seeing all the things that are happening, police responding, making arrests, doing all the things that we're doing. You know, we want to make sure those kids are being taken care of if, they're, if that's needed. Yeah. So what Handle With Care does, it allows the police officer to send a quick memo to the school system saying, hey, John Smith here, you know, we went to call to John Smith's house and, uh, you know, Johnny may have been, you know, may have seen or been exposed to some things that may be traumatic, mm -hmm. Handle With Care. Mm -hmm. And that's all the information we give. So the school system kind of mm -hmm. keeps an eye on Johnny and makes sure that yeah. if Johnny acts out, has uh, attention problems at school, and, you know, maybe has some issues, maybe they're tired because they were up all night because the police were there all night long, right? right. Um, it doesn't become a disciplinary issue for that kid at school and that the school start looking into some counseling and maybe some additional resources to help that child. Yeah. So again, the idea here is doing what we can to break this cyclic behavior mm. of addiction and criminality that not just happens for individuals, like, but is generational. You know, at 22 years in law enforcement, mm -hmm. I start seeing us arresting and dealing with the children of the people we were arresting mm -hmm. 10 and 15 and 20 years ago. Right. Like we're trying to find ways um, to get in there and disrupt some of those patterns uh, um, so that we can try to give people opportunities to live good, happy, healthy lives. Yeah, not operating in a vacuum. That's, I mean, amazing to hear that component. Yes. And I, th I don't think a lot of people know about that, like you said. Um, with more than 20 years in law enforcement, um, in your opinion, why is a unit like this needed specifically here in Chatham County? Um, you know, Chatham County has got a very good relationship with its law enforcement. Um, and cops who work in Chatham County, um, they typically come on the job with some idea of wanting to make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Wanting to do more, wanting to improve the quality of lives for people um, in one way or another, you know, however they word it. Yeah. And the BHU is just a very unique uh, way of being able to make that difference in somebody's life mm -hmm. without putting someone in jail, recognizing that sometimes people need other things, um, you know, beyond what police offer and how do we go about connecting those individuals. Um, you know, the BHU is a tool that builds trust between the community and the police because we're not there to enforce a law or to disrupt a family or to take people apart or to separate people. Right. Um, and, and, and sometimes uh, in, in the courses of our duties, that is somewhat of a, of a, a side effect of us doing our job in, in the right way. Right. 
The BHU gives officers in those circumstances a chance to come back to those individuals and families and go, there are some resources to help you mm -hmm. after we deal with this. Like, you know, we're, we, you know, we're here not just to address the incident that we're being called upon to address, but to hopefully give these individuals what they need so that we, they don't have to call us again and we don't have to come back and do that. Um, you know, we don't want to be involved in people's day-to-day -day lives if we don't have to be. Mm -hmm. And people call 911 when they're in crisis mm -hmm. and, and when they don't know what else to do. Uh, and the police are the first ones to arrive. So we should be able to give the community a resource um, within the police department mm -hmm. that recognizes that there's a need beyond enforcement of laws uh, and that there is some sort of connection to care that happens when those crisis calls happen and then in the aftermath of what happens after the death settles. Take us yeah. home. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, Sean. I was no, just right. listening. Um, one other question that I have, Hiram, is when you you talked about how you're in your vast experience a, a, a arresting someone, then their children, then their children's children. If you have a history with someone, and then they overdose because they were depressed and they tried to end their life. Does the BHU address that aspect as well, or is it just talking to people who are really in a bad state? Is it after the fact as well that you guys investigate? So all of that sort of depends. I mean, there's, you know, right now there's one of me and a lot of calls for service. <laughs> um, so you have to kind of prioritize what's, you know, most more critical to respond to right away versus what right. types of individuals just need resources. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the way we do it is our high risk individuals who are a danger to themselves or others. Mm -hmm. Those are the individuals that we prioritize for mm -hmm. response calls. You mentioned Maine earlier right. when we first started, right? I mean, individuals who are on our radar for high risk of danger to themselves or others, uh, those are the individuals we want to immediately try to make contact with and try to find out what type of services we can provide. Or if we need to do something involuntarily, we utilize the power of the law and we do what we can to get folks involuntarily um, taken to a treatment center for an evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, that's paramount. The next steps are looking for individuals who are frequent users or abusers of 911, folks who are just calling 911 over and over and over again mm -hmm. that we can't resolve their issues um, and it's taking away from other calls for service that need police response. Mm -hmm. So yeah. trying to identify those individuals and try to be proactive and addressing those individuals needs so they're not calling 911 um, over and over again for things that right. are not necessarily emergency related you know, at, at the time. Um, so there's a criteria there for identifying some of that on, on how we respond, um, mm -hmm. but ideally we want to be able to provide all of that information to everyone in the aftermath right. of an overdose or a loss or something like that yeah. because, um, you know, grief and the cycle of grief uh, is different, you know, for everybody as far as the duration, right. you know, and there's going to come a time in that process where someone's going to want to have information, they're going to need information and they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to want to know more and, and that's the time we want to be right there to be able to provide that resource and give them that information um, because knowledge is power. It helps people understand what's happening. It helps people plan for the future mm -hmm. and helps people put things in, a, in perspective so that, um, again, they, they can keep things, they can keep their cup from overflowing and things not become uh, a crisis in their lives as well. So we do want to make sure that we're providing information and that mm -hmm. you know background for individuals on what those resources are available. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as crisis response and BHU, we're trying to hit the more critical individuals in our community um, who could you know, potentially be, again, a risk to themselves or others. Um, and we want to try to get a hold of those individuals first. And once we've done, dealt with all of that, mm -hmm. then we start picking up all of the other things and making follow-ups as necessary, as needed. Yeah. Um, I think that you kind of touched on this a little bit, but you know, in the sense of stopping the cycle of recidivism, do you think that this is going to make an impact like you said, you're, you're really bridging a gap that maybe not wasn't there and addressing certain needs of individuals. You know, I think it's too early to tell um, whether or not this is going to have that kind of long term impact. Uh, we are doing everything we can to track the data to be able to show that what we're doing is having an impact on recidivism. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, you know, putting all the effort on the front end of, of, of helping individuals, um, we would 
like to say mm -hmm. that once we've connected folks with care and once we've gotten people um, in a situation where they're dealing or addressing their underlying issues, mm -hmm. we would hope that they're not committing the same type of criminal activities and, 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 and uh, breaking the law in the ways that they were doing it when they were untreated. Right. You know, so, you know, as, as, as we're tracking this information moving forward, that's what my bosses are looking for, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Rivera, what are the, what's the numbers show me, right? <laughs> right. What, what do the numbers look like? You know, yeah. so, you know, I'm out um, in the boots on the ground trying to make sure we're, we're, we're changing the tide and the culture of what, how we're responding to these calls. Mm -hmm. um, but on the back end, the critical component is tracking the data, uh, making sure that we're, we're not working in silos and that the right. data is, you know, collected in one big, you know, round, you know, bin in which if we all need to drag information out of there to come to some conclusions or determine whether or not we need to improve services or change some of the things that we're doing or maybe even ask for funding to expand on a few of the things we're offering, the numbers are going to tell us everything. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mean, on the back end, you know, data is critical, um, but on the front end, it's, it's boots on the ground. Um, interpersonal skills and, and then doing what you can to really truly care about the people who are who are, who are in front of you um, and that's what it's about. Very good. Any other questions, Joe? I think you nailed it. Yeah. Uh, you can really see your passion behind mm -hmm. this and, yeah. and the difference that you want to make in the community so I think it's paramount that we have folks like you within the county spearheading initiatives like this to help people in need. Thank so you. thank you Appreciate so much that. for your time today. Thank you, John. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And if you'd like some more information about the BHU, we're going to put some stuff on our all our social media platforms. You can check out our YouTube page, and it'll also be on the county's web page. Um, Hiram, anything that we've missed that you think folks should know who are going to be watching this about BHU? Yep. or um, So the BHU and ECIT mm -hmm. is fairly automatic. It's built into our 911 system. So you don't have to call and ask for that type of officer. If your call is a crisis call, mm -hmm. if your call is a call involving mental health or those types of things, our new uh, RMS system, Central Square, mm -hmm. is designed to recognize once those questions are answered and triggers a response for a crisis intervention team officer or possibly a community paramedic um, or a combination of officers, CIT officers and paramedics or, and EMS um, to respond to those particular crisis calls. So. People don't have to worry about asking for a very specific type of service. Once the call comes into 911, uh, the operators and 911 dispatchers will, will ask the right questions and will send the resources out to the scene. And uh, we're operating already. Uh, we're out there. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing what we can every day. Uh, so the, nothing's changes as far as the request for services. It's just from the internal side, mm -hmm. what we're dispatching to those particular calls. Mm -hmm. um, you just need to know that you're getting a well-trained officer that has got the knowledge, skill, and ability, and the resources um, to, to provide some additional services after the crisis calls taken care of. Great. Right man for the job right. at the right time. <laughs> and this goes far beyond law enforcement. It really does. And I want to thank you, Hiram, um, for taking the time out of your day. You are busy. And, you know, I think it was important for folks to hear your message and more about the BHU and what it has to offer and how it's impacting the community. So thank you. Thank Appreciate you it. For Sean Evans, Corporal Hiram Rivera, I'm Robert Katniss. We'll see you next time on The Chat.